Yeah, so thank you for joining at the end of a very full day. Uh, my name is Seth Wiesman. I'm a data engineer at MediaMath, and I've spent the past several years building streaming applications using Apache Flink. This talk is a collection of some of the best practices I've picked up during that time for testing stateful streaming jobs. So consider this word count. While it's a fairly simple data stream, I'd argue that this map function is deceptively difficult to reason about. That's because there's no way for us to know what this code is going to output without having witnessed all previous invocations. And if we can't reason about the output of our code, there's no way for us to know if that output is correct. Contrast that with something that's stateless, where the same input always results in the same output, also known as being referentially transparent. This is the easiest type of code to reason about explicitly because it does not depend upon the context in which it's run. Something that works in development is going to behave the same way in production. But that is not to say that referentially transparent code cannot have state, but simply that its state is explicitly passed through the application, making it easy to reason about and test. We can see, for instance, what happens when we have a very strange initial state, or maybe no initial state at all. Do we still get the correct output? Do we still get a sensible updated state to use in the future? What we're looking to do is take this concept of explicitly reasoning about our code, working with it in such a way that it's easy to test, but marrying that to fling strong state management guarantees and doing so in such a way that's very easy to use. So this talk's gonna be focused around some variation of a word count application, and the stipulation we're gonna add for ourselves is that everything we do must maintain exactly one semantics. So we'll start by looking at operator state, and I wanna write a source. Something can read a file from my resources folder and output each line to the stream. To do that, we'll implement two interfaces, both the source function along with list checkpoint for our state management. To track our state, we'll simply count the number of lines we've output downstream so far, so that if we ever have to recover from failure, we know to simply skip the first n lines of the file. Now, if you squint your eyes, this already kind of looks like what we're after. I have some methods for my business logic and others for my state management. Only this one variable, num lines, ever really crosses this boundary, meaning we can more or less think of these things in isolation. And that's going to give us a clear path to start testing. I can first just look at my business logic. Does this thing do the thing that I claim it does of reading lines from a file? Only after we validate that do we need to move on to our state. And because we went with list checkpointed, which is a very high level interface, it's easy for us to simulate different scenarios. We can see, for instance, what happens when we restore after having already read the first two lines of that file. Do we skip those two lines and read the rest? Well, our test says that we do, so we feel confident that we have the exactly one semantics that we're after. So now we have a way of reading in some data, now we want to do something with it. We'll say we have a main stream that has a lot of words coming from somewhere, maybe Kafka. And then from our resources folder, we're building up this other much smaller stream of filter words. These are things we want to filter out of the mainstream. We do not want to report on them. Because the number of filter words is so small, we decide to broadcast the full data set out to every instance so we can avoid network shuffle on the mainstream. We'll connect the two streams together and do the actual filtering through a co-flat map function. Now, the business logic for this is fairly straightforward. We're just going to build up a set of our filter words, and now every time something from our mainstream comes through, we'll simply check that set for inclusion and do something appropriate. The question is, how are we going to manage our state? Our first instinct might be to reach for list checkpoint because it was so easy to work with just a moment ago. But reading through the documentation, we realize that list checkpoint does a round robin repartitioning when it restores from failure. And that would lead to non-determinism in our application, as we need to make sure that every word ends up back on every instance when we restore. So instead, let's go for the checkpointed function, which gives us more fine-grained control over managed operator state. And one of those controls is the ability to choose our repartitioning strategy. So let's pick union state, meaning provide the full data set to every instance when we restore, so we can guarantee that everyone's going to get a consistent view of the world. And because we know that all instances have the same data to begin with, Flink's checkpointing mechanism is consistent, and we're using union state on our restore, we only actually need a single subtask to write out its data, uh, which could potentially lead to large savings in our state size if we're running at a very high parallelism. So once again, testing something that uses the operator state is fairly straightforward. We can just create an instance of our broadcast filter and start pushing elements through, seeing that we're filtering out the things that we expect. And for our state management, we maybe said, you know what, this is pretty simple, I have an integration test that's going to be well covered there. But something wasn't quite working, and we decided we really need a unit test to try to suss out the problem. Unlike last time, it's not entirely clear how to do that. We're working with these more low-level constructs, I have these different operator contexts to get passed in. I don't know what I need to concern myself with. Do I care how the data is serialized? How does that repartitioning strategy come into play? While these are important questions, they're not things I necessarily want to have to know the answer to just to write a cursory test of my code. So instead, we'll reach for the operator test harnesses, which are functionality part of Flink's internal test suite used to validate the data stream implementation itself. 
Now, before I go any further, I want to be very clear that this is not currently part of the public API, meaning it is liable to have breaking changes even across patch releases. I, in general, would not recommend this as a first option. I think that most uses of operator state and application-level code tends to be fairly simplistic and can be well-validated through integration testing and good code review. And because these were built for testing Flink itself, it can sometimes be difficult to toe that line between testing our code and testing Flink. And at the end of the day, I'm only interested in testing code that I've written. However, they do provide some very powerful functionality, and certain use cases like this can be incredibly useful. So it's a good tool to have in your toolbox. So we'll create a new instance of our broadcast filter. There's a little bit of boilerplate as we wrap it in this test harness and manually run through the steps of Flink's lifecycle. But now we're ready to go. So we'll push the word hello through as a filter word, meaning it's going to be put into that set and ideally should be a part of any snapshot that I take. And now this is the really cool part. We can take a snapshot of the state of this operator without having to understand how that works under the hood. I just know that these bytes are a valid representation of my state. And so we can now create a new instance of our broadcast filter wrap it in a test harness, and then restore from that snapshot. And if we've done this correctly, we should see that pushing the word hello to the other side is successfully filtered out. Our test says that it is. So once again, we feel good about our exactly once. Now, while operator state's important, I suspect that most interesting uses of state in application-level code is going to be focused around keyed state, where we're getting all like elements into the same place. And the good news is we can write a lot of very complex code using keyed state and flink without ever having to explicitly think about our state management. Between windows and reduces and aggregate functions, there's a lot of very complex stateless things that we can write. For example, if I want to output the third instance of every word in my stream, I can do that using a count window and a reduce function, never once explicitly thinking about my state management. But of course, this isn't always going to be an option. Sometimes we need that more low-level control. And so the same functionality could be implemented using a rich flat map function where I have this value state descriptor that represents my count. And now every time something from our main stream comes through, I'll need to go into the runtime context and pull that count out of the state backend, check and do my business logic of outputting data and clearing state, or maybe updating the count and storing it back into the state backend for later. Well, again, this is semantically equivalent to the code on the previous slide. It is much more difficult to test. There is no separation between my business logic and my state management, meaning I cannot think about one without the other. We are going directly into Flink's runtime, which is leading us to potentially have to mock out quite a bit of functionality to write a simple test of this code. We could once more reach for the operator test harnesses, but that really feels like a hammer when I'd like something a little more delicate. Even if we were to go that route, there's still a number of cases that are not straightforward to test. For example, I want to see what happens when my count is already two. Using the test harnesses, there's no clean way for me to do that other than to simply push the right elements through in the correct order, and that seems very fragile. But it turns out I'm using the Scala data stream, and it has this other flat map function, flat map with state, whose API says I take in both some initial element along with optionally some initial state, and then it outputs both what a flat map outputs along with optionally some updated state to use in the future. Now, this is exactly that API we saw at the beginning, where we are explicitly threading our state through the application, meaning our business logic can be fully referentially transparent. And so here's the same functionality once more, but written for flat map with state, where our account is being very explicitly passed through the application through function arguments and return types, which means that we can now test any combination of input data and state that we deem interesting. I can see what happens when we have no initial state. Do we initialize it properly? Or we, if we have some state, do we update it in the correct manner? Are we outputting the correct results? But I think the most interesting part is how simple the implementation of flat map with state really is. There's no black magic here. If Flink did not provide this API out of the box, there's no reason we couldn't have built it ourselves. It really just follows this simple pattern of initializing some context, right? We're setting up the current state of the world, running some black box business logic function, and then doing something appropriate with the results, outputting data downstream and storing new state. And so while flat map with state is certainly not going to be expressive enough for a number of scenarios, this is a pattern we can really sink our teeth into. Process functions were built with a general purpose API for solving general purpose problems. But as application developers, we are not solving general purpose problems. We are solving very specific problems. And so by specializing to the domain, we can come up with APIs that are both pleasant to use and easy to test. So I want to look at a slightly more complicated example that's going to require the use of a process function. 
Let's group all elements of the same key that occur within 30 seconds of each other in sort of the same way that a session window would. When we see the third instance of a particular word, let's output it downstream immediately. And when more than 30 seconds have elapsed in seeing any data, we want to clear our state. And if we've seen more than three instances of a particular word, we'll output it to a heavy hitter site output. And if we've seen less than three instances of a particular word, we'll output it to an infrequent element site output. So we're really touching a lot of the different functionality that Flink provides. So we'll start by determining what's our context. What is the minimum amount of information that I need to solve this problem? Turns out there's really only two cases, when an element originally arrives and when that computation is final, and when that timer finally goes off, excuse me. So when an element arrives, we'll need both the word along with the current state of the world, which in this case is both the count along with the current watermark. And I'm going to return back both optionally some word to output downstream, along with a new timer that needs to be set. And when that timer finally does go off, I'll need both the word along with its final count, and I'm going to return back optionally something to output to a side output, and in this case I'm using Scala's either type to differentiate between the two. And so we can first just look at our business logic by implementing that interface, getting as complex as we need to, but never once thinking about the Flink runtime. So I'm looking at my counts and making determinations of whether or not to output data down, outstream. I'm setting timers based on the watermark. And when that timer does go off, I'm checking the count and determining which, if either, side output I'd like to use. But then inside of our process function, we're going to do almost nothing. I'm just following that same pattern we saw before, where we're going to initialize the context, right? Setting up the current state of the world. We'll run our black box business logic function and then do something appropriate with the results, outputting data downstream and setting timers in this example. And so now when it comes time to test, we can really look at these two things in isolation. First, just focus on our business logic, looking at whatever combinations of input data and state that we deem interesting, getting all the code coverage that our domain requires. But then inside of that process function, this is certainly going to be the more difficult segment of code to test, but we've written almost nothing. In fact, on this previous slide, there aren't even any branches here. There's really just a single case. And so while this test case may certainly be more fragile, there are going to be fewer of them, and so we're more likely to maintain them in the future. So now we've built all this really great functionality, and we've shown that it works in isolation. But at the end of the day, if we can't run the full pipeline and validate results on the other end, we haven't built a product. And that's where integration testing comes in, right? We want to run that full pipeline given some input data, validating the results on the other end. And Flink certainly provides some functionality out of the box to help us do that. There are interfaces we can extend in our test suite to help us set up local Flink clusters. And if you walk out of this talk doing nothing else other than setting up an integration test in your code base, I think you've done quite a bit, right? You've gone very far in showing the correctness of your business logic. But I said at the beginning that we wanted to show exactly once. And what that really means in practice is that in the face of failure, our application will be able to recover from a checkpoint successfully without dropping or double counting any data. And similarly to our business logic, the only way to really show that is to try it out and see what happens. So I'm of the opinion that you should run every integration test twice. Once that just focuses on the business logic, takes some input data and validates the results, and a second time that runs that exact same stream over the exact same input data but this time with checkpointing enabled and an exception thrown at some point in the middle. If we've done this successfully, we should see that both of these tests output identical results, and we can feel really good that we have achieved the exactly one semantics that we were after. The details of how to do this are slightly more complex than I want to get to in this talk, but I recommend you take a look at the bucketing sync integration test for a good example of how to do this. So I hope you've learned a little something about writing stateful streaming applications and testing that code. Uh, the full code samples from this talk are available on my GitHub if you're interested. I'd be happy to take questions if we have any time. Thank you. So yeah, I think the... Um the example, I forget what it's called, that where you actually are separating the uh, state management from the rest. What did you call your class again? Uh, that's the, uh, algebra. I, 
Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's okay. Anyway, I, just, I thought that was a pretty cool thing. Do you think that is something that is properly generalizable that could be yes, uh, and actually sent upstream? I, I will admit there was a version of this talk that went much more down the functional programming rabbit hole. Um, so I, for instance, do our billing and invoicing through a co-flat through a co-process function, right? And there needs to be a high level of confidence that that code is correct because that is how we pay our bills. Um, and so there are different things that you can do to help have that clean separation. Uh, something called uh, tagless final encoding that I have found works really well in this context where you can kind of set up this interface where I can really easily test these different combinations and get a little more control than this simple interface gives. Uh, but then inside of the process function again, you basically don't do anything. You just call the code. Yeah, it's a, I really like the idea. I've spent quite a lot of time writing process functions because I really like process functions, except I, I always do it the first time, and then I realize I'm mucking around with a state in a bunch of different places, and then I do a pass to extract it. And so thinking about some way that you can formalize mm -hmm. that separation. Is yeah, cool. and I think, I mean, this wasn't something I would necessarily want to get into in this talk, but if you're familiar with functional programming at all, this is the state monad, right? Like, th there's... There's already a lot of functional stuff in Flink, just not necessarily given the proper, you know, given the official name. And it works really well because we can both get the clean separation of business logic and state that we want for the reasoning uh, without giving up the data locality that Flink uh, provides as a, as a benefit, right? It's, we don't want to go back to having a separate database. Uh, but, but that little bit of that line between them can make all the difference in reasoning about your code. And of course, at the end of the day, if you can write it in SQL, then do that instead. Uh, it looks much cleaner in Scala, but is it possible to do this in Java or Java 8? Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why not. So like, uh, flat map with state is only available on the Scala data stream, but as I was getting to, it's a really simple interface, right? You don't have to use the option type. You could use null to represent no state. Um, really, all we're looking to do is have this separation where I've got, I go into RocksDB or wherever else, and I pull things out uh, really naively, not thinking about the business domain. Then this piece of code knows nothing about the business. And then again, it does almost nothing with the return results. So I might not even write a test for this. I can look at it and have a code review and have an integration test and feel pretty good that it's correct. Um, focusing all of my energy on this piece of code where I'm really solving my business problem. All right, looks like there are no more questions as of so far. Thank you very much again, Seth. Yeah, thank you.